as a sort of background to this talk, you can find a lot of amazing things about Corvids by looking online, like Googling how intelligent they are, caring they are, just generally amazing. So I do mention a little bit in the first slide about things you can find out online about their intelligence and things like that. And they are known to be extremely intelligent. You know, even up to the age of seven, children are said not to be as intelligent in some ways as Corvids. And I think recently a study came out saying that they may be one of the most intelligent species on the planet. Um, I think ravens were one of the most intelligent species on the planet and the Corvid family as a whole could be one of the most clever families on the planet. Um, so what I'm going to do, the most of my talk, probably about 90% of my talk, is going to be more about my experiences rather than general. And the reason for that is just because, as I say, you can find a lot about it online, but what I'm going to be sharing tonight isn't something that you can find out online. And so I want to kind of add my say as to how Corvids are amazing by talking about my personal experiences. So the first slide is more general, Corvid Intelligence and Compassion. So I've just got a few points here I'm going to go over. Um, you can see the pictures on the right hand side. These are some quite well known Corvids. Uh, you can find out about them online as well if you type in their names. They're quite well known um, as Corvids go. Although there are quite a lot of well known Corvids out there because people just really have a strong connection with Corvids and have relationships with them as I do um, and as I'll be saying. So things that have been found out about Corvids are, for example, Corvids have been seen caring for the young of others if their parents have died. So they'll basically adopt others. Um, there is an example when a jay was near to another, I think it was a crow's nest. And at first the parent crows ignored the jay. And then after a few hours, they started feeding them as well. And there's been examples where the parents have died and they've taken over the nest. Um, studies have found things like they can be suspicious of others. And that might not sound very exciting or interesting, but it really just shows the intelligence. Uh, for example, when they're food caching, they found in a study that if a crow uh, caches some food with a human or a magpie they found in the same room as them, they'll then move the food somewhere else when the person's not there or the magpie's not there anymore, which shows that they're aware they're being watched and they know that they might be stolen from. Magpies have also passed the mirror test, which is quite a well-known test, which surprisingly few animals are able to pass, where they put a dot on the animals, or like a, I think it's a blue circle on the animal's chest, and another animal might peck the mirror and not really understand, whereas the magpie will have self-awareness, so they will actually start pecking their chest because they see in the mirror that there's something on them that shouldn't be on them. And it shows a really high level of self-awareness, which very few species actually have. Um, they, can find, they found, sorry, in another study that they can recognise faces for years and they pass on information to others. So in this study, this man went to a local crow colony wearing this mask. And I'm not exactly sure what he did, but he did something to antagonise them so they didn't like him. And a few of them swooped him and learned that if he was wearing this mask or in, for them, his face meant that he was a bad person and they recognised him. But they actually found that three years later when he returned to this crow colony, not only did a few crows sweep him, but 66% of the crow colony swooped him, which showed that, first of all, they had a very good memory, three years, recognising this face. But also, it seemed very likely they actually passed this information on to others, because for it just being a few crows and then uh, three years later, two thirds of the colony knowing that he was bad, I think says a lot about how they probably let each other know that there was something wrong with this man. They also have fun. So you can see this picture at the bottom of a crow sledging. I think it's a well-known video you can find on YouTube. Um, a crow gets like a, a tray or something and it sledges repeatedly down a roof. And in, um, I believe it was a sanctuary of some sort, there were a group of magpies housed near to some chickens and the care of the chickens would shout out to the chickens when it was food time and the chickens would come running and the magpies actually learned to imitate the, um, the care of the chickens to make them, the chickens come running. And they do that repeatedly for fun, but the chickens unfortunately never wised up. <laughs> so um, the magpies got to keep imitating them, uh, the care. And they're seen playing with other species, um, other corvids of the same or different species and mammals as well, like sometimes companion animals. Um, they use tools, which is known to be something, you know, intelligent animals do. Um, they found in a study there was a crow which actually managed to fashion a hook out of something it was given to pull out some food. And there's the well-known Aesop's fable, but also truth as well, that crows can... And when I say crows, often I'm talking about corvids in general, but I think specifically in crows it's been found that they can drop stones into water to make a food source that they want rise. 
and it's just it just shows really they're all around just very intelligent um they rear their young in these big family groups so their young stay with them sometimes for years and they can actually help to rear their siblings the next year or the next two years later and they have other very clever ways of finding food for example most people have probably heard of this but if you've not then i definitely definitely need to tell you because it's awesome um they don't just drop things for example a nut that has a shell around it onto the ground to break it but they've also been found to drop things with shells around them onto roads and then wait at zebra crossings until lights change or crossings to lights change so that vehicles can drive over them and then they they walk and get the food and take it back so they're just they're so aware not just self-aware but aware of the world around them and just generally intelligent and amazing so that's my sort of generalized uh, wonder of Corvid's section the rest is a lot more personal to me so my personal experience of caring for Corvid's um, I've been doing wildlife rehabilitation for about two and a half to three years now at two different rescue centers and I also did it for about a year before that in my flat as well because we used to help the local wildlife rescue center by picking up animals in Aberdeen and then taking them there after a little while and I'll be talking more about that tomorrow as well. Um, from experience, um, corvids are quite, I mean, they're clever and they know how to hurt you if you pick them up, like they can twist their heads and they twist your skin because obviously they don't want to be held. But from experience, I find that rooks are really gentle. I'm sure this isn't the case for 100% of rooks, but all the rooks I've handled in captivity, as soon as they realize you're doing something to help them, they, they seem to go very gentle, like they know that you're helping them. And I'm not sure why it's specifically rooks, but I've only seen this with rooks. Um, I think there's something special about them. There's, there's something special about them all, but I don't know, there's something about rooks. They just seem to understand you. Um, they're easily bored. So if you have them in a cage, which for any other bird would probably be okay, they just start shredding everything and you can tell they get bored and they, they just want out. I mean, none of them want to be in a cage, but you can see this level of intelligence which makes them bored. So you have to ha often have to give them toys or scrunched up paper or that sort of thing. And some of them can open cages. So you also have to <laughs> be careful about that as well, which again, I don't think any other um, type of bird we have in other than Corvids has done that, or at least not, not in my experience. Um, so they're really social birds and you can see this I've seen it from my experiences in general, they're, they're happier when they're with others. But this magpie you can see here, we had him for about a year and he was reared from a really young magpie and he was absolutely fine. But for some reason, his tail feathers never grew in. And you can see from this picture, he doesn't have any tail feathers. And we didn't, you know, we wanted to give him a chance and we kept giving him a chance. And it got to the point it was about 12 to 14 months and his tail feathers still hadn't grown in. And there's just something not quite right about him. And he was reared with one other and the other one was fine and got released. And we started to worry this magpie is just going to be sitting in an aviary for the rest of his life, just with no other magpies, just not happy. But then the following year, we got in uh, two or three other magpies that were reared. And when they were old enough, they went into an aviary with him. Now, this magpie, the whole time he'd been with us, he hadn't been tame. Um, I mean, when he was reared, he was sort of semi-tame, but he went out to the aviary and wilded up really quickly. But as soon as the other magpies went out with him, not only was he really interested in them being there, but all of a sudden he started to gape for food as if he was a baby again, even though it had been about 12 months since he'd done this. And his tail feathers grew back. And after a few more months, he and the other two got released together, which is just, I think that just really shows that he, what he needed was friends. And not only did he get released with them, but um, there were magpies living on site at the time who had actually been reared, I think two years before that, and they'd left and then come back and the two that had been reared um, separately actually ended up becoming a couple and sort of wreaked, wreaked havoc over the whole site. Um, but yeah, they, they're just amazing and caring for them is a treat, but also you need to watch for your hands because they do know how to inflict damage if they want. Nothing serious, but they, they just obviously are clever enough to know how to hurt you and where on your hand to bite. <laughs> so this is the main bulk of the talk, Corvids I've known. And as I said, the main reason I want to do it this way is because I could read off a million facts that you can find online, or I could tell you about something which you can't find online, which is my personal experience. And I think I've always heard, and I'm always going on about this thing called an enthusiasm infection, where if someone talks about something they're really passionate about, they can inspire people who maybe have never thought about it in that way or have never really been passionate about it before. So I just think talking about your personal experience with something 
is just the best way of making others interested in whatever subject it is. So this is Dora, really original name, Jack Daw, Dora. Uh, I named her shortly after she came in. So she came in, I wanna say August, 2018. I think that's right. And she was picked up about 20 minutes away from where I lived at the time. And what was wrong with her was she, her wing was slightly off angle her left wing, I don't know if you can see behind the zoom thing, but there's a picture of her on a bucket and you can very slightly see that her wings off angle, um, but not, you know, not a ton. Um, so she was caught in a very old fashioned way of catching birds, which is just a string and a, and a cage carrier where you just shut the door. And she was lured in there with um, some corn, I think it was. So not, not the sort of thing you'd expect a corvid to get extremely excited about. But she had a wing deformity, but she was absolutely fine. She didn't actually have any problems flying or anything. So she got released. And for whatever reason it was, I can't remember, but she got released on site. And she was only in captivity for maybe a month or probably not even that, because there wasn't really anything wrong with her. Um, so she lived on site. She decided to stay. Most of the animals you release would go off, um, but she decided to stay. And she was around us every single day. So she learned to come when cold and we'd feed her. Um, funnily enough, her favourite food was Lair's pellets, nothing that you'd expect, you know, you'd think that she'd maybe into something a bit more meaty, but Lair's pellets were her favourite food. Um, she didn't mind the odd egg from chickens as well, so she'd get that sometimes. Um, you can see on the bottom left picture, that's the walkway to where we used to live and she'd, she'd stand there and wait for food. On this particular day, we gave her some bread because she'd just been harassed by the magpies I was just talking about. They didn't like her at all because it was breeding season and they saw her as a threat. So um, we didn't usually give her bread, but that time we thought she needed a treat because she'd had a pretty bad day. Um, and also where we lived was the, the complete opposite end of the site where the magpies lived. So she liked to hang out with us a lot. Um, she wanted to be on country file. So we were on country file a couple of years ago talking about the probably 500,000 mascara ones or something that our rescue center received at the time. And she always would stand in the background behind whoever was being interviewed when on camera, because I think she was trying really hard to get on country file. But unfortunately, she didn't manage and she didn't appear. But it's only fair in her that you all know she tried. Um, she, was a f she was just such a nice corvid. You can see in the top picture, that's her sitting next to another jackdaw. And they were only about a foot apart. And what happened was... We didn't have many jackdaws come in, but we released one on site one day and she sat next to us and she watched the jackdaw go and it landed on the roof of the barn. And she flew up to the jackdaw straight away and we thought, oh no, she's gonna, she's gonna chase them off because this is her territory, but she didn't. She sat right next to him and I think she was comforting him saying, you know, it's safe here. I'm another jackdaw, you'll be fine. Unfortunately, the magpies then came and chased them off. Um, you know, they're fine. The magpies were just like that at that time of year, but it just says a lot about her. She wasn't uh, defensive or offensive or too territorial. She was just being friendly. And, and funnily enough, it was actually maybe only a few months later that she then had a mate who possibly could have been that one for all we know, because we didn't see many jackdaws around there, but they certainly were about. So yeah, that's the beautiful Dora. And I don't know if you can see on the bottom right of the screen, because I'm not sure if the Zoom thing's covering it up, but um, she was good friends with a girl called Weggy, who I'll be talking about a lot more tomorrow. Uh, gulls and jackdaws probably aren't known to be good friends, but this herring gull and this jackdaw were. <laughs> right, so this is Jack. I only knew Jack for about two months, I think. Um, I met him April this year. He lives, or should I say lived, because unfortunately he passed away this summer. He lived at the Wildlife Rescue Centre where I work now. And he was six years old, so quite a good age for a magpie. When he was younger, he used to be quite aggressive, but he ended up mellowing in his old age. And with, you know, wildlife rehabilitators sitting around having lunch, he obviously learned that they weren't a threat because if anyone's not gonna be a threat to an animal, it's obviously gonna be a wildlife rehabilitator who spends all their time looking after animals. And so he would just sit with us at lunch every single day and just cause mischief and try to break into the staff room and steal biscuits and, um, People would give him some of their food as well. Uh, for example, if someone had a pot noodle and at the bottom of it they had a bit of some peas or corn, he would dig into the bottom and get their peas and corn. So yeah, he was just he was just nice. And I only knew him a couple of months because as I say, unfortunately he died. Um, I don't know how, but, but you know, he just passed away. 
Um, but yeah, he was a nice one as well. And there's been a lot of Corvids I've met. I could have mentioned a few others, but the bulk of the talk is going to be about the two, which I have at the moment, because I have a lot of experience with them and a lot of stories and nice things to tell. So I'm going to move on from Dora and Jack to start talking about Brook and Bram. So this is Bran. As you can see from his picture, he doesn't have any eyes, although technically he does have eyes. They're just really, really small. They're probably about 10% of the size they should be. And they're also concave rather than convex or sticking out like they should be. Uh, he came in because he had a congenital eye deformity. So he was actually born like that, or should I say hatched like that? I don't know whether his siblings had it as well. All I know is that he was found on the ground in a woodland sort of running around confused. And he was really young at the time. So I assume that he just either jumped or fell out the nest and obviously he couldn't see anything. Well, it's quite amazing, I think, that he was able to still gape from his parents. I think he must have learned the sound of the, uh, his siblings when they were gaping or the sound of his parents or something that made him know what to do so that he still got fed, which is quite impressive in my opinion. His nicknames are <laughs> Bran Pot, Pot Boy, Noisy Boysy because he is a noisy boy, Molly Man because he's like me in the mornings, he wakes up and he just, just wants to go back to sleep and his eyes are, I mean obviously his eyes are kind of shut anyway, but you can just tell he's very sleepy and he just sort of moves his head, his head around and tucks his head under his wing, which if I had a wing I would also do in the mornings, so we're similar in that way. He's about um, a year and a half old. He's one month older than Brooke, roughly. And we just know that because she came in about a month after he did and she still had a very yellow beak, but he didn't. Um, he's got a lot of favorite things. I'm sure there's a lot more than I've mentioned here, but he likes peanut butter, oat cakes, jingling toys. So he used to have this cat stand, his stand on, he just shake, shakes the bell on the end of it. And I think the reason he likes jingling toys is probably just because you know, he can't see, so he likes things that make sounds instead. He likes sunbathing, and I've got some amazing photos of sunbathing coming up. Uh, attacking snakes. So his cat stand has some kind of, I don't know whether it's say string or rope, it's sort of in between in size. And he just attacks that sometimes. And we always joke that he's battling a snake. He likes splashing. So because he can't see, he doesn't really get as affected by the light as Brooke does. So for example, this time of year, Brooke gets tired about now because she knows it's dark and other jackdaws in the wild are roosting and things like that. But Bran, he doesn't know that it's dark. So sometimes at 2 a.m. I'll wake up and just hear this splashing. He'll just decide to go down at 2 a.m. and have a bath because since he can't see, it doesn't matter to him that the lights are off. So that's um, that's good, good fun. <laughs> uh, yeah, he loves toe and underwing strokes. He likes being read to, again, because he can't see something that he can hear. And toys with bells, I've sort of already mentioned that. Um, He's a really clever boy, so he knows a lot of voice commands. I don't really like the word commands. I'd say voice instructions because he doesn't always adhere to them. And um, why should he? Why should he do what we ask all the time? But he knows things like step up, um, down, peck. So if you want him to if you take him from his cage outside every day, outside as in into the living room, um, they only really use their cage for sleeping and to eat because we used to feed them in the living room, but it was a bit of a mess. So um, now if we're gonna hand feed them like a bit of fruit or something, I'll just say peck and he'll notice the peck. And I've also taught him water. So if you hold a cup underneath him and say water, he'll know to dip his head down and drink just so that he doesn't have to go back in the cage every single time he just wants a drink. Um, other words I think he knows are things like touch or spray. So if I'm gonna spray him with water or touch him, I'll say those words. And obviously I don't know for sure he knows them because there's no way of me knowing, but I think he does and it's better that than just touching him or spraying him and him not knowing because that wouldn't really be fair on him. He does occasionally refuse to step up if he's having too much fun. So um, a few months ago when I was staying at my sister's, he was in the garden and he was having way too much fun. So when I said step up, he just shouted at me instead, which is fine. Like I say, why should he have to listen to me all the time? He also took part along with his sister on uh, in a charity calendar um, event called Gotham the Croft, where he and his sister both starred in the calendar. So that was good fun. Because he can't, he, he knows the surroundings of his playpen, but because he can't just go and get something in the same way as his sister can, if he's thirsty or he's hungry or anything, he'll just shout until we do the right thing. And again, you know, that's fair enough because he can't really go and find the food on his own. His sister can forage around the playpen or she sometimes comes around on the living room floor and just walks around or we, we can tell what she wants basically, but it's not as easy with him because he doesn't really venture looking for things in the same way she does. So he'll just shout and then we'll, we'll deliver. 
Uh, let me look what else I've got. I've written like some notes down here just because there's so much to say. I knew I'd end up forgetting something I really want to say if I didn't make a note. Um, yeah, he likes, I think again, possibly because he can't see, he likes having things over around his head. Like he'll make himself blanket for it so that he can like hide amongst the blankets sometimes. And um, there's this hoop in his cage, which originally had a food bowl in it for a parrot, but obviously he doesn't have the food bowls in there. And we found out a way to take the hoop away. So we took the hoop away a couple of weeks ago. But as soon as we took the hoop away, Brown just didn't know where he was when he went up to the top of the perch and he ended up freaking out a bit. So we put the hoop back on. Um, he is gentle because he's blind. And I think just because he is gentle, a lot compared to his sister anyway. He, he's just a gentle boy. And like there's been times when, for example, once a butterfly lands on his back, and if that was Brooke, she would have probably just eaten a butterfly, but he just sat there and it was really nice, just a little butterfly just sitting on his back, kind of just a perfect example of what Bran's like. He's um, easily spooked. So if his sister jumps, for example, and he assumes that she's scared, he'll take that noise cue as, as telling him basically that he should be scared. So he'll, he'll sometimes panic about something which isn't actually happening, but it's really easy to calm him down. We just pick him up and we stroke his head and he calms down very quickly. He, it's almost like sometimes he understands what we're saying. For example, if you say some, if you say a joke or you make a joke about Brooke and Bran, he'll always shout as if he's like, hey, what are you talking about? And one morning, Brooke and Bran had been silent all morning because they don't talk constantly. And they hadn't said anything all morning, maybe it's probably about 11 a.m. And Kevin, my partner said the phrase, kill two birds with one stone. And at that exact moment, Brooke and Brown went bah! really loudly as if they were both saying, hey, you can't say that in this house. So now we do what my friend once said and use the phrase feed two birds with one seed, which they're a lot happier with. Um, yeah, so he's, he's very well behaved apart from when he doesn't want to step up, which is, is fair enough. Here's his sister, Brooke, and it's just a coincidence that their names sound similar. It wasn't even intentional, so. Yeah, that's just, maybe subconsciously it was, but not as far as I know. So her nicknames, Burt Pants, Pants, Monster Munch, Madam, Pantaloon, and Wrist Rocket. So as you can tell, very serious names for her. Um, wrist Rocket, because she'll sit on your wrist, and then when you put her down, she just jumps off. So Kevin always goes, Wrist Rocket, go. Um, madam, because she is a little Madam. Monster Munch, I don't know why. She's just a Monster Munch. Um, <laughs> as I said, she's about a, a month younger than Bram. Um, so she is in captivity because she's missing half of one of her wings because of a predator attack. And we assume it was a cat, but we're not 100% sure. She was found by a woman and reared in the woman's garden. So the woman just, I think she was either found in the woman's garden or the woman found her and put her in, their, uh, in her garden. And she was reared there with her bad wing. And when she was younger, she was on so much medication and she had a really, really tough start to life. And she was just a little scrap when she was younger, but she's doing great now. She's, yeah, she's really different. And even though she's only got half a wing, you know, it, it healed really, really well. So it's actually, I don't think it causes her much trouble at all. Like I used to worry about it, but now I just, I don't really think about it because she, she just does so well. But I'm, I'm always looking out to make sure she's fine. And she is. And if any time that changed, obviously I'd get it checked out. So her favorite things are fruit loaf, which she gets extremely rarely, monkey nuts, um, which she gets a bit more often. She likes sitting on shoulders. She likes splashing, although she doesn't splash at 2 a.m. because she can see. Um, she likes biting phones. She likes head strokes. She likes shredding paper, sunbathing. And she also not just likes, but loves Bran, but she'll never admit that because she needs Bran, she needs him a lot. And when she doesn't know you're looking, she'll be snuggled up to him. But then as soon as you look, she'll just hop off as if that was never a thing. Um, but if Bran goes out the room, and by saying that, I mean, if we take Bran out the room, she will not stop shouting until we bring him back. And sometimes she does that when one of us leaves the room as well, because we're part of her flock. Um, but like I said, she'll never admit to loving Bran, but she really, really does love him. Um, she demands respect because she's got a changeable mood, although she is very loving. And I even think in the last six months, she's come out of her shell a lot. I think she's just really happy. Um, there's pretty much always one of us at home now. So she's out of her cage pretty much 16 hours of the day. 
and we take her out to the meadow and we take her to friends houses not at the moment because of covid but when things are normal we take her to gardens of our friends and she loves exploring and she just has a really good life we try and give her as much to do as we can she does bite sometimes but she never tries to hurt us she's never bitten me in any way similar to how a corvid in a rescue center has bitten me it's always just sort of a warning and usually it's not even really a bite it's just sort of she makes this sort of noise jackdaws make they kind of breathe at you when they're unhappy with you and she usually just does that um she doesn't like fingers although she's getting better i think when she was younger because she was in such a bad way she was always getting grabbed and having medication put in her mouth or injected or whatever so i think she just has some sort of ptsd involving fingers because you know wouldn't you if you're getting grabbed when you were younger every single day or even twice a day but she's getting a lot better now because she liked her head strokes. And I think she's learning that human hands don't have to be a bad thing. Um, she recently, unfortunately, or fortunately for her, discovered that when she's sitting behind you on the sofa, because she sits on the sofa with us sometimes, if you're eating food or drinking water like this with the plate on your lap, she can run down your arm and try to steal food or try to steal water, which we don't let her do, but um, she has tried that in the past. So she, she's still learning, unfortunately, or fortunately. Um, she sits on my lap when she's scared, which is really cute. So when we we're occasionally outside having a picnic and one, well, one time a gull landed near us, um, or if there's a loud noise, she'll just run towards me and she'll just sit on my lap because she knows that'll protect her, which is really nice. It's nice having, what was a, a wild born bird doing that? And obviously I say wild born bird, this isn't bird. This isn't something I encourage people to do. We were just lucky to have them and they, I hope I can say are lucky to have us. It's not something people should be going out to try and find. Corvids are best free, and I'll mention that a little bit later. Um, yeah, actually, this is more about Bran. I don't know why I've put it in the book section. Um, yeah, one morning I came through to the living room, and Bran, because Brooke and Bran, they talked to us as well, and Bran and Kevin were just talking to each other, so Kevin would go, bah, and then Bran would go, bah, and they did that about 20 times, so they like to talk to us as well. Uh, when we moved into the flat that we currently live in, it came unfurnished. Um, they actually had a sofa before we did because obviously you need to get your jackdaws a sofa before you get one. That just goes without saying. So <laughs> they have their own sofa. It's really an armchair, but um, it's just Brooks really. Bran doesn't really use it because he doesn't really know where he's jumping to and from. What else? Um, yeah, she's really cute. When you're, when you're stroking her head, she usually taps her middle toe, just like she's really enjoying it. She has a little window of her cage. Whenever we go out, we just leave her a little window, um, i.e. the sheet is like folded over slightly different because she likes looking over, uh, looking out the window. And she lets us cut her nails, which is a massive um, step forward. We still have to kind of hold her to do it, but she's completely calm and we put her down again and she's just, she forgives us straight away, which is huge, I think, because that could be really stressful. So life with jackdaws is entertaining they well they are entertaining you can probably see from the pictures that they're entertaining Brooke likes to read with Kevin on his shoulder um Bran gets a very messy beak because Bran can't see when Brooke's eating she just picks up the individual bits of food whereas he just puts his whole beak in and just like pulls out chunks at a time because he can't see and he ends up with an amazingly messy beak but she always just shakes onto us most of the time um because he can't pick out his food kind of bit by bit he always we always have to mix it all up um, for him and we interact with him in a very different way so he's a lot more hands-on and a lot more talking and stroking whereas Brooke can have entertainment from toys like her with a cat toy for example and they do need a lot of enrichment they're they're because they're intelligent they need a lot of enrichment and things to do they bring up pellets you know it's I think quite widely considered that just birds of prey bring up pellets but loads and loads of different bird species do including jackdaws. And one time Brooke decided to throw a pellet in my cup of tea. So that was nice of her. Um, food caching, that's another thing they do. Brooke likes to cache food in the sofa, her sofa, luckily, but it doesn't really cause too much of a problem since it is her sofa, not ours. She... Yeah, that's pretty much all for that. Oh yeah, no, something else I didn't mention. Life with jackdaws, they become a big part of your life in every way. And I was going to mention a few things, which I'll be mentioning in one of the next slides. But I think now is a good time to bring out something which I received today when I got back from work in the post. And this is actually 
part of a Christmas present for my sister. And just to show how much of an impact Jack was having in your life, she actually made me, or should I say them, a stocking each for Christmas with treats in them. So um, yeah, they've become a part of the family. Let's just say that. <laughs> More pictures, because why wouldn't you want more pictures of jackdaws? Um, that's Bran in the meadow. I don't even know if you can see my mouse, but if you can, that's Bran in the meadow, the second to the top left. Brooke looking scruffy, because um, she decided to go down to my cup that day and have a bath in the water. The bottom right bar one picture is Bran yawning. It looks like he's shouting or stressed, but he's actually yawning. And then the picture above that is of Brooke shouting. I think she was shouting or yawning. I think she was shouting. And I decided to make her into some headphones because I thought that looked nice. Um, another good way of showing what it's like to live with jackdaws um, is just to see the sort of things I've posted online about them. So here are a few examples. I don't know, some people might be watching this on their phone. So I'll just read them out really quickly just in case anyone can't, um, can't see what they say. So Brooke likes being at different levels, so we got her an armchair. She likes pecking phones, so we're giving her an old phone. She's currently enjoying pinging an elastic band, so I'm thinking what next? Get her a guitar? And we haven't got her a guitar yet, but it might happen. Probably not, but you never know. It just shows the kind of things you think about when you've got a jackdaw in the family. Um, overheard Kevin talking to Bran, the blind jackdaw, while he hand-fed him a chili, because birds don't suffer from... Um, spiciness kind of they don't suffer from spice like mammals do i tell you bran you may not be able to see love in my eyes but the love in my heart you can feel and that was just too cute not to post and here's brooke how to have fun lesson one pellets by brooke when your brother coughs up a pellet steal it then hop around with it and try to eat it flicking most of it onto the book that your mum's reading 10 minutes later cough up your own pellet get it stuck on your on your foot Hop around with a pellet foot, then play tug of war with the kitchen roll sheet your mum uses to get it off your foot, making more pellet fly around the place. And the bottom one. Oh yeah, this is sisterly love right here for anyone that's not read it. Brown was trying to find something to play with and Brooke saw him getting very close to her toy mouse. So she picked it up and threw it away, sisterly love. And by the way, she didn't play with it herself. She just threw it away so that he couldn't get to it, which is really nice of her. And the other one is just a text I got from my mum last year. So this is about last Christmas, not this Christmas. And I just thought, again, it just sums up how the relationship you have with jackdaws and how much of how big a part they become of your life and your surrounding family. So text from my mum says, regarding Christmas, since you'll be coming in the van, would you want to bring Brooke and Brand's giant cage? We could keep it in the drawing room so that they can join in the festivities. And they did join in the festivities and uh, we brought them presents and wrapped them up and then unwrapped them in front of them. So that was a... A good Christmas. Unfortunately, this Christmas is obviously going to be nothing like that. All right, here's a video. This is Bran. Um, I tested this before the presentation started and it worked fine, so hopefully it'll work fine now, but fingers crossed. This is him playing with something. One or two other videos. Oh, there we go. This is her being nice and quiet. And this is a beautiful picture of her and Kevin and myself that doesn't really need an explanation. And this is, I think, the last video. This is just Bran getting some love. And I just wanted to show you this because when Bran came in as a youngster, well, Brooke came in really young. So she was tame in the sense that she was too young to really care. But Bran wasn't tame when he came in. I should have mentioned that before. So it took a lot of training to sort of tame him up. And because he was blind, 
it had its own challenges and teaching him words had its own challenges. So I just wanted to show just how far we got with him, that he's 100% happy and comfortable with this. And also he's just completely a friend now. I've got a lot of videos like this. <laughs> And in case you're wondering, the photo on the right is of Kevin encouraging Brooke on my head and me fearing that she's going to poo in my eye. Sunbathing. I promised you sunbathing photos. So this is what jackdaws look like when they're sunbathing. They sort of look a bit panicked or a bit evil, but this is what they do. And um, they just they just love the sun. And it's funny because Bran obviously can't see. I think he just feels the heat and he can sense light a little bit with his eyes, but I think it is mainly just the heat. So it's very fun watching in some way. So to sum up, the best Corvid is a free Corvid and this Corvid here is Dora. So if you find any bird, not just a Corvid, any bird needing help, the best thing to do is to take them to a Wilder Fresky Center. Even though I've just mentioned some amazing stories I have with uh, well, you know, captive tame birds. It's not the best thing for the bird. If Brooke magically grew a wing tomorrow and was able somehow to be uh, wilded up, then I would release her because that's what's best for her. The fact she's with us is a suboptimal life, but because I know she's happy and Bran's happy, I let them stay with me. And I, I, I'm always kind of assessing, are they having a good life? And that's the most important thing. So if you do find a bird needing help, please take them to Wally Fresky Centre because they have like the, the time and the means and the money and incubators and the food and the vitamins, just everything that's needed. So the way Brook and Brand live isn't how birds, corvids, any bird should live. Be careful when feeding wild birds of any species, because if you tame them up, then that's great until a neighbor doesn't like them and wants them shot or wants them removed. So just always be really careful. Always put the animal before your wishes and tell others how amazing they are. The best thing you can do to help any animal is this enthusiasm infection I talk about. You tell other people just how amazing they are and how many good experiences you've had with them because it's people that drive the message. So it's each other we have to listen to. I think how I describe jackdaws, I would say corvids, but having only had such close experience with jackdaws, I would describe them as being a lot like cats. They're in charge in that they see themselves as at the same level or above us, but they play. They play with cat toys, they hunt, they love cardboard boxes, they cuddle, they love, but they also miss us as well. And they're just a lot like cats in that sense. So I really hope you enjoyed the talk and feel free to check out my talk tomorrow, which is about urban birds. And it's kind of going to be similar to this one in that it's about my experiences with pigeons and gulls mainly. <laughs>